Give me a mic. Thank you. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is the Riley and Kimmy Show. Willie the Pooh, Willie the Pooh, Willie the Pooh, Willie the Pooh. me, Winnie the Pooh, and don't forget to remember to stay tuned to the Riley and Kimmy Show. And don't forget to remember to keep on bouncing, says Tigger. <laughs> Welcome to episode 439 of the Riley and Kimmy Show. It is a special day. That's right. I consider it my day, in a way, in a very small way. Right next to me is Kimmy. Kimmy, I got one name. Kimmy. And Kimmy, you know what day it is? St. Patrick's Day. Patrick's lucky. He's got lucky charms. Always have to be lucky charms. The cereal with sweet surprises. Hearts, moons, stars, clovers. They're coming. I'll make a box to hide in. Ooh, Ooh. Lucky charms. Magically delicious. Oh, going back to 1972 there with the uh, audio from the commercial Lucky Charms. Did you ever eat Lucky Charms or was one of those you avoided? Oh, yeah. Um, now, be honest. Did you actually eat the cereal or just the marshmallows in the cereal? Mm, well, Come on. Um, Come on. I don't recall. Uh, oh, really? I don't recollect, Senator. That's right. <laughs> I, I, I don't recollect. Sure. Come on. You, you just ate the marshmallows, didn't you? Mostly. Yeah, shame on you. Anyhow, and... Marshmallows. Oh, would you be quiet? Those are one of those things that are off my uh, food intake list can't have those anymore but we you know we can have other types of things and other types of fun here on episode 439 of the riley and kimmy show yes kimmy was right it is saint patrick's day and being saint patrick's day kimmy we're going to have a little special show here we're going to go back in time in just a few moments please stick with us for that a rare old time radio recording i mean it is rare going back more than 75 years that we're going to do for St. Patrick's Day. Radio was new. Radio, someone still loves you. And that's the Riley and Kimmy Show. We love radio, especially the golden age of radio, old time radio, as it's also known, or for the hobbyist, the collector, OTR. Now, a big old time radio show was the Fred Allen Show. It was huge, and he was an American comedian, an absurdist, and had this really a topical, opinionated radio show that ran from 1932 to 1949. And he was a master ad libber and would get in trouble with his mouth with censors all the time, and he was cutting edge. He would make fun of the censors and the network that was, you know, coming down on him. Think uh, Howard Stern of his day a little bit, hmm. you know, and, and he just, you know, laid it out on the line, and that was the kind of show he did. It was fun and a lot of an improv and just, you know, ad-libbed. Now, he was an influence to comedic talents like Groucho Marx, Stan Freeberg, and a man by the name of Johnny Carson. We can actually trace the Tonight Show. There are elements from the Fred Allen Show that Carson did tribute to Fred Allen. That's just how mm -hmm. important he was. His radio show was big. It was at the top slot many times and was at number one in 1946 to 1947 that season. And because he was at number one, he was able to negotiate a lucrative new contract as a result not only of the show's success, but thanks to the large measures to NBC's anxiety to keep more of its stars from joining a guy by the name of Jack Benny, because Jack Benny bailed from NBC and went to CBS and was taking people with him. He took Bing Crosby. He took Burns and Allen. That's George Burns and Gracie Allen. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to take his friend, even though people thought that they were enemies because they had a running gag going on for years, he tried to take his friend, Fred Allen, over to CBS. Well, NBC said, uh-uh. And so they coughed up some coin. But what is ironic is within a year, Fred Allen was knocked off his top spot, not by Jack Benny, not by that talent raid, but by a newer network called ABC. And they had a quiz show called Stop the Music, hosted by Burt Parks, that required listeners to participate live by telephone, and the show became big enough to hit 
Allen's grip on that Sunday night time slot that he had for years. I think he dropped down to like in the 30s in ratings. Mm -hmm. And he was so, at first, I think he thought it was kind of funny. And he actually attacked his rival on the air and would offer people $5,000 if anybody actually received a call from Burt Parks. He said, I give you just $5,000 if he calls you. And nobody, you know, he never gave it away. But he was acknowledging the competitor and basically, that may not have been a smart thing to do, considering he was at the top of the slot, hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it, it hurt him. But we're going to go back when he was reigning king. He and Jack Benny were, you know, right at the top of the game. By the way, Benny, at this time period, when I was talking about uh, Fred Allen's demise, uh, Benny kept going. And Benny embraces television and moves into TV, does radio and TV at the same time for a period of time. Just a phenomenal individual that we have uh, focused on old time radio on the Riley and Kimmy show before. But right now, St. Patrick's Day is the day, and we're going back to a rarely heard broadcast from 1937, March 17th, 1937. It is the St. Patrick's Day episode of the Fred Allen Show. Thought we'd uh, check that out. Yes, some of the jokes will be dated, but it's a time capsule here, and I hope you can enjoy it. And by the way, before we listen to it, let me point out one thing. Yes, it is inferior audio by today's standards please be forgiving for that these programs were done live they were not recorded to be kept at all fortunately someone recorded it way back when and it was not easy because they didn't have tape to do this back then there was no digital recording either uh, they had to use something that was very similar to a, a record player that would record on these big discs complicated very expensive very few of those recordings survived. So we're quite lucky to hear this. We're going back in time to March 17th, 1937. Here's Fred Allen with a St. Patrick's Day episode on the Riley and Kimmy Show. An hour of smiles in town hall tonight, folks. 60 minutes of fun and music brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Salapatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty, Salapatica for the smile of health. Fun with our star comedian Fred Allen, music by Peter Van Steeden, and our special added attraction, the Town Hall Variety. New music, new voices, new laughs, it's Town Hall tonight! <laughs> Fred Allen as he leads the parade to the old town hall. Fred's leading the band with a shillelagh and is followed by those green horns of the theater, the mighty Allen art players. Let's join the merry throng. Everybody's going. Everybody. Here they come, delicatessen leaders. Morris, why are you refusing to slice some corned beef for Mrs. Corn? The slicing machine is making static on the radio stand and it's town hall tonight. <laughs> Look, Professor Kill, the spirits are moving that radio up and down. The radio is merely dancing for joy, madam. It's town hall tonight. <laughs> Reno divorces. Your grounds for divorce are cruel and inhuman treatment, Mrs. Boggs? Yes, George. My husband always turns off the radio on Wednesdays, and it's town hall tonight. <laughs> Well, sir, here we are before the old town hall. It's St. Patrick's Day, and Fred is welcoming the crowd with a brogue as folks pass inside. Let's listen. Bigari and the Jabez. Old King Cole was a merry old, a merry old soul, folks, and he got that way from coming to the old town hall. Sing the line, please. Hi not... there, booby boy. Hello, Jason. Is it Hi there, Mrs. Fumble. Step right in. You laugh, you shout like all get out on the inside. So hurry, hurry, hurry. We're hurry. all set inside, Fred. Surprising, Harry. <laughs> Peter's opening the show with swing high, swing low. Right, old Fred. Let her swing, Peter. <laughs> Swing 
Presenting that bombastic baron of big, blatant bursts of bubbling, baffling buffoonery, bristling batter, and biangular oh, bread buttering, no. blustering, Harry. blistering Fred Allen in person. <laughs> Gosh, Harry, you left out Bristol and Myers. I don't know how. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, before we preen our verbal feathers and prepare to give your risibilities, a rousing tickling this evening, I hope. I'll read you the town hall bulletin for tonight. Hodge White, everybody's grocer, says that nothing's happened this week, folks, so there'll be no announcement. Yay! Thank you, friends. And now we'll get along with the town hall news. The curtain, Harry. Coming right down, Fred. <laughs> the lights go out, and we bring you the latest news of the week. The Town Hall News sees nothing, shows all. New York City, New York. Dr. R.P. Wodehouse, speaking at the American Institute of General Sciences, claims that hay fever and asthma are increasing in this country. Dr. Wodehouse says clearing up of native vegetation and its replacement by alien plants will add to number of victims. Town Hall News shows how sensitive some hay fever victims may become shortly. The scene, a train waiting room. We can sit down here, Wilbur. The 515 isn't ready. Yes, dear. Shoot. Just don't idea. Is your hay fever starting? Yes, somebody's eating strawberries at the lunch counter. The, the straw starts to be sneezing. Strawberries. That reminds me. I forgot to phone the market about dinner. Have you got the number? Yes, it's hay market. Shoot. Don't, don't say hay market. You know that hay upsets me. All right, I won't say another word. Achoo. You! What was that? I don't know. That woman just passed. Is she wearing a goldenrod corsage? I don't know. She's going by again. You! Every time she walks by, I see. I'll tell her to get away from here. Oh, uh, pardon me, lady. Yes, sir. Did you call me? You! Would you mind walking around the other way? You see, my husband... Are you intimating that I am ogling your husband? No, but why is it every time you pass... You start my husband's hay fever. I'm a grass widow. I do. <laughs> New, York. <laughs> New York City, New York. A new hit show opens on Broadway to delight New York theater goers. Critics guarantee evening of laughs to patrons attending play called Yes, My Darling Daughter. Town Hall News presents three-second review of this new laughing show. Yes, my darling daughter. Daddy, you say one word has made you the biggest man in Hollywood? That's right, daughter. What is the magic word, Daddy? Yes, my darling daughter. <laughs> New York City, New York. East Side Merchants Association agrees to do away with men outside of clothing stores who approach customers and try to pull them into shops. Town Hall News shows old sales approach method on each side when the puller in function outside of a clothing store. Monster sale going on inside. My dream bomb is sacrificing their suits. All kind of bottles, herring bone, tweets, tin killers, drying the cross. Hey, how about a suit, butter? No. Hey, no. take your finger out of my button. No. Step inside. I'll show you a pencil stripe double breasted that will knock your eye out. No, 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 no. Get your hand out of my collar. No. You're stepping in, buddy. No, I'm not stepping in. Now, let me go. I got to catch a bus. You are needing a suit, buddy. I don't need no suit. Now, quit pulling my lapel. You are needing a suit. Who says so? I am saying so. Look. What? Oh, what's the big idea ripping my lapel? I can't go home this way. That's what I'm saying. You are needing a suit. Step inside, buddy. <laughs> With the puller in salesman of this type banished, Town Hall News shows the new methods customers can expect as they pass east side clothing stores in the near future. Hey, boy, there. Talking to me, mister? Yes, sir. Confidentially, I'm needing a suit of garments. No. <laughs> no, thanks. I just bought a suit with four pair of pants yesterday. You could use three coats, maybe, to go with the extra pants? No, hey, quit jostling me. You're going inside, buddy. Get your hand off of my spine. Quit jostling. Inside, buddy. Hey, I thought the east side stopped this pulling in business. So who's pulling you in, buddy? I'm pushing. <laughs> New York City, New York. New 20th century picture, Love is News, is held over a second week at the Roxy Theater. Produced by Darrell Zanuck, written by Harry Tugand and Jack Yellen, Love is News registers comedy triumph. 
Town Hall News brings you a 10-second preview of this excellent film, Love is News. Wait for this latest paper, read all about it. What's the headline, boy? Jack Benny and Fred Allen kiss and make up. Is that a front-page romance? And how, mister? With those two mudslingers, love is news. New York City, New York. Ship officers report stormy crossings on Atlantic Ocean. Record gales lash heavy seas, and ships experience trouble in navigating through storms. Town Hall News flashes candid camera shot of a terrible sea. The sea. Encore, encore, Harry. <laughs> I don't know about the bow, but it was good and nitchy there at the beginning. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And now, roll over. As you I was saying, for one minute, please. If, I, if, if you'll bear with me, just, I would like to see just a would. moment, ladies and gentlemen. I'll uh, I'll try to find out what's on the my mind of this disgruntled Eskimo. If you'll just turn around. Well, I was just practicing. Why, Harry Von Zell, a big boy like you. <laughs> It might have sounded funny, but you know, last night I was reading about Demosthenes. And what are Demosthenes? <laughs> oh, spread out. A big boy like you. Demosthenes was a famous Greek orator. And he used to practice speaking, you know, with pebbles in his mouth to improve his diction and enunciation. Like this, look. And... Oh, friends, rowers, and country. And just what do you... He didn't say that. Huh? And just what do you... <laughs> Just what do you hope to accomplish pursuing this strange pastime, Harry? Well, Fred, I, I just thought I'd keep practicing so that when I passed along those friendly tips about salopatica, there wouldn't be a chance of a single word being missed. Because to know about salopatica is to know a mighty effective way to get after those dull, logy, headachey feelings we have so often. Those under-par feelings usually caused by accumulated waste and resulting acidity. You see, ladies and gentlemen... Sal hepatica is the mineral salt laxative that gets after both of those things at once. It removes waste through laxation, and it helps nature combat that acidity. So the next time you feel under the weather, put two teaspoonfuls of sal hepatica in a glass of water and drink it. You'll soon be feeling your old normal self again if you remember sal hepatica for the smile of health. <laughs> Peter Van Steeden and the Ipana Troubadours have just played Serenade in the Night. 
Now, on Friday night, there will be an... That's their hour! Oh, God. Now, quiet, please. Look, if that is somebody left over from a... Uh, Hello? (laughs) Well, I'll say you've done it again, haven't you? (laughs) Well, sir, the, the chairman laughed when I said I was going to take the floor. He didn't know the linoleum wasn't paid for. Well, it can lay there with the linoleum. As well. <laughs> well, if it is in Portland. Yes, Papa sent me over to see you. It's very important. What's important? Papa says you should make up your mind what night you're going to be on the radio. Well, you don't think just because I went on with Jack Benny last Sunday that the people are getting confused, do you? Oh, they are. I saw the man upstairs brushing his teeth with Jello this morning. Well, <laughs> see, you will get a life membership in the Don Wilson Foundation for that. You've saved them that much work next Sunday. Well, that doesn't make any difference. People brush their teeth with Jello just as long as they don't try to buy iPanner in six delicious flavors. They'll be all right. Come in. Telegram for Fred Allen. Right here, boy. All right, sign here. Here's a pencil. Thank you, son. The boy's still waiting, Mr. Allen. Uh, thank you, son. Don't give me none of that, buddy. Now, see here. Listen, Greaseball, I don't mind not getting my tip, but when you try to cop my pencil, you're rubbing it in. <laughs> here's your pencil, Stickler. Okay, cheapskate. That boy's too fresh. Why don't you tear up the telegram and get even with him, Mr. Allen? No, here, you uh, you read it. I've, I've got to blow down my neck. Blow down your neck? Yes, I'm, I'm getting hot under the collar. <laughs> I'll see who the telegram's from. All right. <laughs> what does it say? Dear Palsy Wowsy, happy birthday to you. I know it isn't your birthday, but I had to have an excuse to send you loads of love. Who sent that? It's signed Jack Benny. (laughs) Oh, Jackie, hey? (laughs) He's a prince. Oh, there's a sweet guy, Portland. (laughs) Good old Jackie. Gosh, he's so sweet, he's almost sticky. the birthday wire when it isn't your birthday. Listen, it isn't the stupidity. It's the sentiment gets me. (laughs) There's the whitest guy I know. Yes, you thought he was anemic. (laughs) Now, listen, don't let anyone tell you Jackie Benny's anemic. He just stays white on purpose so everybody else will look healthy. Gosh, Jack must have a big heart. Why, Jackie Benny's heart's so big, you can put a stethoscope on him any place and get action. <laughs> Did you hear his program last Sunday? Yes. What was that static right in the middle of it? Static? Was it before or after Jack and I sang? It was during. During? <laughs> well, let me tell you something. A lot of people didn't catch our names when we sang. How do you know? Nelson Eddy got 300 wires from people who said they enjoyed his double voice solo. <laughs> Gosh, to me it sounded like two wildcats picketing a pet shop. Two wildcats picketing a pet shop. <laughs> Do you know that the next morning after Jackie and I sang at the pier, all of the flowers bloomed in Central Park? (laughs) They thought the robins were back from the south? That's done it. Mr. Blow! That's done it. Tom, Right, babe, you don't have to page humble blow. Just drop a hint. I can hear it before it hits the ground. Come on up. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Portland. I don't mind you bringing people in here, but when they're all wet, they leave puddles. Listen, Ham, you ought to be flattered to be seen with a couple of good eggs. Ho, ho. That's telling them, Casper. Ho, ho. Is Casper saying something, Mr. Blow? Only a simpleton can understand Casper. That's why he's talking to himself. Well, you ought to be able to catch Casper's drift, bud. Ho, ho. 
Somebody ought to... Somebody ought to put a sign on Casper's mouth, open by mistake. Now, take it easy, brother. Yeah. You're jeopardizing the friendship of Humbert Blow, the outstanding theatrical agent of this generation. Mr. Blow furnishes all kinds of talent, Mr. Allen. Oh, oh, and how? Why, Casper here can put your program on a map, simple. What does Casper do? Imitation. Right. Name your sound, folks, and Casper goes to town. How about a, uh, a fin calling to its haddie? Quit clowning, bud. How about molasses coming out of the jug? Okay, let's go, Casper. Now, wait a minute. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Molasses in this weather will take too long. Okay, give us a ginger ale bottle, Casper. Sounded like somebody with false teeth munching castanets to me. <laughs> well, you ain't had nothing yet. What's next, Castle Boy? Oh, oh, a lion. Quiet, folks. One lion. Take it away, Casper. <laughs> How's that, Nubhead? It sounded like the Holland Tunnel backfiring to me. <laughs> hey, no belittling, bud. Can Casper do a Jersey cow, Mr. Blow? Well, Jersey's too far away. You wouldn't hear it. Uh, how about a New York cow? Listen, the only thing that gives milk in New York is a waiter. How can that give milk, Mr. Allen? Yeah, what about palatera fish? Never mind, never mind. Give us the cow. Okay. <laughs> One whole sign, Casper. Yeah. Boy, are you hot. What's next, Casper? A foghorn. Okay, blast, Casper. It sounded like you and Jack Betty singing, Mr. Allen. Now, you leave my pal out of this. And now, folks, with your kind attention, Casper Entertain is one and all with his own original barnyard community sing. What's that, Mr. Blow? It's a foul choir. Foul is right. <laughs> Quiet, dope. Give us that glimmer rock on cymbals, Casper. <laughs> He didn't lay an egg, he spread an omelet. I'm hiring him to break a lease in a boiler factory. Why, you? We better beat it, fellas. Nice exterminating, Portland. <laughs> so long. Howie. Ho, ho. And now the town hall quartet, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight the boys sing a spiritual called Head Low. Great day, great day, don't you hear that joyful sound? Your foes, my foes, they're all camp meeting bound. Come on, honey, let us follow the crowd. I feel the spirit in the shouting out loud. Don't wait too late, let your better self decide. Give out, give in, swallow all your pride. Cause every day is judgment day Let's be on time to hear that good old deacon say Head low, evil ground Head low, hold your ground Oh, there's no 
him talking, the devil's walking, yes, walking off to the land. Hello, let him kill. Hello, keep out fear. Oh, the times are coming, the times are coming, brother. We need the good Lord's hand. Good news, good news, you can send this word around. My soul, my soul was lost, but now it's found. Come my children, let's be gone on our way. I feel the spirit in the sky to say we need to read the good book through and through. We need to heed like they used to do. Make some limb block your step and stone. Oh, how you love to hear that deacon when he moans. Hello, kill him, mend your ways. Hello, everybody give out praise. Cause to religion, to religion is a feeling you understand. Hallelujah. Hello. It takes some sticking before you get to the promised land. Where well, you got shoes, and I get shoes. All God's children get shoes in the promised land. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, boys. And now for a thrilling excursion into the realm of the esoteric. Oh, goody. Do we take sandwiches and hard-boiled eggs? Do we take them where? To the thrilling excursion. Oh, Harry. <laughs> that was just my erudite way of introducing a little item concerning beauty in Japan. A little music, uh, Professor Van Steeden. <laughs> there was a time in Japan when black teeth were considered beautiful. So they were dyed black with a liquid composed of iron filings and a species of nut applied to the teeth with a feather. I panna, I panna, I panna. What do you mean I... by that, Harry? Well, Fred, that's just my erudite way of introducing a little item concerning beauty in America, where only sparkling, naturally white teeth are considered beautiful, and where I panna toothpaste plays such an important part in our standards of loveliness. Because I panna is more than a toothpaste. For when used with massage, it helps tone and stimulate tender gums. The dentists say, When our gums are soft and tender, our teeth are seldom bright and sparkling. Today, our gums do not get the exercise and stimulate than they need from the soft, creamy, well-cooked foods we eat. So we earnestly suggest that every time you brush your teeth with Ipana toothpaste, you put a little extra Ipana on your brush or fingertip and massage your gums with it. It's the modern way to give them the toning and stimulation they need to help guard against gum trouble. Since Ipana goes so far in helping you have cleaner, brighter teeth, and as a result, far lovelier smiles, it will certainly pay you to always remember Ipana for the smile of beauty. <laughs> Well, there's the theme song of the Mighty Allen Art Players, and they'll be with you immediately after your station announcement. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we present the little group that inspired that song's success this year's hit is the Mighty Allen Art Players. Tonight, they present a backwoods drama entitled The Great Hillbilly Battle, or harsh words don't always start a feud. It's when somebody says, oh, shoot. Over to your Peter. Oh, quit, quit, uh, quit, quit, quit prodding me. What? What is it, Sally? Get out, you lazy juggin. Well, it ain't, ain't hardly daylight yet. Past daylight. The sun's slow this morning. Well, everything ready? Yep. Your rifle's loaded and the coffee's on. Good. I'll, uh, I'll take a shot over at the Carver's cabin. Let them varmints know we're up and we're in the feud. Uh, take that, you lout. Ah. <laughs> uh. Any luck? Well, I don't know. I shot low into the cabin. Case old Carver's sleeping on the floor. Oh, there goes our last window. 
Yep, the covers is up. <laughs> They're tidy this morning. I'm getting sick of this field in, Eli. I ain't been out this cabin for nigh on 40 years. And you gotta stunt your wanderlust, Harry. <laughs> For the last 200 years, us Allens has been feuding the Carvers. Three generations, Allens, has been born, farmed, feuded, and died without leaving this here room. Well, it's mighty convenient, but that's all. My uh, great-grandpa Luther is buried yonder under that uh, butter churn there. <laughs> Grandma Nell's and Uncle Dud's tombstones were using for bookends for Pilgrim's Progress. <laughs> And you're standing on Cousin Nathan right now. It's going to be mighty stuffy in here on Resurrection Day. <laughs> Don't ding them covers. Clean through the wall. Where'd that, where'd that bullet go? Yonder in the potato patch under the bed. Well, I'll, I'll just take another pop at them vandals. Uh, you can take this, you prairie, you bangers. Uh, I'll show them. Well, that's all the food and I can go on an empty belly. I'll get the breakfast. Is, uh, Pa awake? I can't tell. He's too lazy to shed his eyes. He sleeps with them open. Pa? Eh? Unhand me, Daniel Bone. Oh, he's dreaming. Pa, Pa, eh? wake up. Pa, wake uh, up. Jeepers, creepers, son. I'm awake. Lord, right through Lydia Pinkham's picture. Uh, them mangy carvers? At them, son. I will. Take this, you snakes. Uh, right through that keyhole by there. Say, what's for breakfast? Owl a la king again? <laughs> no, no. No poultry this morning, Pa. Nothing but coffee. Uh, ain't there no bacon, Ma? Only what's left on the hogs. How many hogs we got left, son? Just the old sow, Bessie. Better to fetch it, then, Eli. Uh, right enough, Sarah. Come out here to your doom, Bessie. Oink, 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 oink. And I'll get my rifle. Here, yeah, now, hold on. You ain't wasting our ammunition, son. Well, I can't do jitsu at a death, Pa. You'll pass out rigid. That's right, Pa. You want to bake and relax, don't you? Yes, well, just put the pig outside the door. The carvers will shoot her. It'll save us a bullet. <laughs> That's cutting down the budget, Pa. Come on, Bessie. Oink, oink, oink. I'll tie a rope onto her so she can't run away. Yep, yep, and uh, better put your head on the pig, son. Afraid your bacon will catch cold, Pa? <laughs> no, no, but if old man Carver sees a pig with a head on, he'll think it's you creeping out the cabin on your stomach. <laughs> he's, uh, he's sure to shoot. Well, okie be dokey, I'll, I'll put my Stetson on her. Teddy bear. <laughs> That looks better on the pig than it does on you, son. <laughs> oh, go shuck your soft corn, Pa. You open the door, Sarah. Oh, that, Bessie. Get, Bessie. Right between the eyes. Well, one thing about this few is you get service. Drag her in, Eli. Okay, but okay. Oh, are you? Ma'am, are you? Ma'am. I'll close the door. Yes, set her over here near the stove, son. I'll uh, amputate some bacon. Hey, you, something funny. It's you, Pa. You got one of your feet on that red-hot stove. Which foot, son? <laughs> <laughs> it's the left one, Pa. Gosh, two of your toes is clinkers. Well, could be worse. I still got three toes left. <laughs> Lord, I wish you'd wash your feet, Pa, before you grill them. Wash them? Wash them for what? I ain't showing off at my age. You ought to stand up someday, Pa, or surprise your feet. Well, there goes breakfast. Carver just shot the coffee pot off in the stove. Adam, son. Yeah. Take this, you rat face scum. <laughs> Bully for me. Bullseye, Eli. Yep. Old Carver was making a sign at me. Well, sir, I shot his thumb out from between his nose and his forefinger. <laughs> <laughs> nice aim and song, uh, There's the postman. No shooting, Eli. No. Postman's got the right of way. The only thing us and the Carver's grees on. <laughs> Open the door, somebody. I'm hauling gingham, Pa. Howdy, folks. Howdy, Abner. Go to 
us any mail, Abner? Just your morning batch of insults from the covers. Yeah? What word of mouth Venom's cover up to today? Well, to start off with, he says, You Allens are so low, they'll have to jack you up to bury you. <laughs> Why, them rodent-eating trash, them weed munching mongrels. Ditto for me, too. Anything else, Abner? Yep, here's Carver's thought for the day. Let's have it. Well, Carver says, you're so all fired mean, you wouldn't eat in front of a mirror for fear your reflection had asked you for a bite. <laughs> Why, that narrow-minded misfit? Any reply? You can bet your bottom postcard there's a reply. You can tell Carver for me. He's so filthy. The last time he met a skunk face to face, the skunk went home with an inferiority complex. <laughs> that ought to write him. Yep, and here's my thought for the day. You can tell that drooling, fork-footed, snuff-dipping goofer <laughs> that he's so undernourished, his idea of high living is dipping his bread into a rabbit track before he eats it. <laughs> Anything else? No, that'll hold Carver for the day, I guess. Well, I'll get along. Can't hold up the mail. So long. So long, Well, Carver'll have to go, son, to answer them insults. Yeah, them slurs will grit him up proper. <laughs> if our son Hector don't want to come home, he could help us with the fuel. Hector's the only Alan ever escaped from the cabin. Say, how'd he get away? I was sleeping that spring. Hector was only four when he stampeded 20 years ago. Yep, creeped right out of the cabin. Kid was so hairy and dirty looking, Carver thought he was a possum. Funny he never sent no word. Well, Hector might have crawled into a gopher hole and quit the human race. You can't tell. Oh, mailman back, Jim. Abner must have forget one of them insults we mailed to Carver. Well, open the door. Hello, folks. Who is it, Eli? Don't know, Pa. It's half in a suit, but a stranger is sporting it. Don't you know me, Ma? Who are you, butter cheek? Why, I'm Hector, Ma. Your male brats have got away 20 years ago. If you're sure enough, Hector, what you doing in that mailman's get-up? Well, Abner let me work, so old Carver wouldn't pink me off coming up the trail. Are you Hector Honor Bright, Bodie? Right as rickets, Grandpa. Just bust into town on a greyhound. Riding dogs is mighty dangerous, Hector. How'd you loll away your youth, son? Been studying at Barber College, Paul. Graduated last week with high honors. Magna cum sideburn. <laughs> uh, what's the uh, latest news out yonder, Hector? Uh, Dewey still holding them off at Manila? <laughs> just, uh, just gather the rest folks around and I'll give you all the news. We're all that's left, Hector. Why, where's Uncle Dud? Uncle Dud leaned out to spit in 27. <laughs> Carver's got him. <laughs> Grandma, too? Yep, yep. She opened the door to shake the broom. They got Grandma between the dustpan and the broom handle. <laughs> Your Ma and me's carrying on the feud short-handed, Hector. Then I just got home in time. Sure did, son. I'll oil your gun. No, I ain't shooting, Pa. I came home to stop the feud. You ain't a going to throw your pa out of work, Hector. Are you catched, son? No, Paul. I'll come back to bring you tidings. Tidings? Tidings. What tidings? Well, sir, the president's got a scheme to help folks like you. You can tell McKinley he can mind his old god dang business. Now, St. McKinley, Paul, it's Roosevelt. Well, we don't want him and his Rough Riders a button in, now there. Now, sir. No, now, this is another Roosevelt president now. He's got a scheme called uh, sociable security. What's it like, uh, bingo? <laughs> no, it ain't no gamble, Paul. When you get to be 65, you get paid. Paid? For what? For being 65. It's, uh, it's a reward like. What's that? <laughs> What's that got to do with your ma and me? Well, you got to stop feuding. If you both get killed off before you get to be 65, you won't get paid. Say, uh, are you sure the government's giving real money? Yep, real money, all right, with eagles on it for spending. Well, money makes the mayor go, and I can feel the hoss coming out of me. Say, uh, it sounds tempting. We ought to call off the feud. Now, hold on. Suppose we stop feuding and Carver keeps on a going. Carver's willing to few me. Abner pumped him yesterday. Fair enough. Might as well give in, Eli. Well, yeah, might as well, son. It's real money. Oh, come, come on, Paul. Well, uh, okay, but dokey, the feud's over. Hooray! Now wait, now wait. Hold on. Before there's any more cheering, when do I get paid? Right way. Here's your 
your sociable security blank, Paul. All you got to do is sign your name right. Now load your guns, folks. The fuel's back on. What's eating you, Paul? What's up there, Gunny, now? Hold on, son. You ain't a passing up that money. You heard my battle cry. The fuel's on. What? You mean you'd rather die fighting than sign your name to this blank, Paul? I ain't got no choice, son. You know I can't write my name. Come on, you cover. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the mighty Allen R. players who, as contributors to the rapid decline of the drama, are not to be sneezed at. And the guest we now present, Professor Jameson, is not to be sneezed at either, for he has made a lifelong study of that famous winter sport. The Professor Savant de Luc says... Uh, during the Middle Ages, ladies and gentlemen, there was a popular belief that when a person sneezed, the soul momentarily left the body, being violently expelled through the nostrils. During that instant of temporary vacancy, the body was at the mercy of the devil who could take possession of it before the soul got back again, unless some quick-witted person protected the body by saying gesundheit. Well, now that's very interesting, Professor. Did all the nations have that belief? Well, some expression of that belief still survives in many countries. In Germany, of course, they still say gesundheit. A French sneeze is greeted with Dieu vous bénit. Italians say salute. And when a person sneezes in this country, if a friend has his best wishes at heart, he will say... Yeah, I know, Professor. Sal Hepatica. <coughs> For while Sal Hepatica won't help you fight off devils, it certainly will help you to fight a cold. Modern physicians say that you can often help throw off a cold more quickly by doing two fundamental things at its very beginning. Remove waste through laxation and help nature combat the acidity that frequently accompanies a cold. And, ladies and gentlemen, you can do both of these things at once by taking Sal Hepatica. So at the very first sneeze, the minute you feel you're catching a cold, do this. Get plenty of rest. Drink lots of liquids and watch your diet. But first, above all else, put two teaspoonfuls of Sal Hepatica in a glass of water and drink it. Don't take chances with a cold, ladies and gentlemen. Take Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. <laughs> Van Steeden and the Ipana Troubadours are playing this year's Kisses, the vocal kisses by the Town Hall Quartet. setting the stage for the next event at the Old Town Hall. The mighty Allen Art players are being wrapped in cellophane to keep them fresh for next week. Huh? And Fred is distributing shamrocks to his guest stars for tonight. Looks as though we're about ready. All set, Fred? Yes, Harry. This is St. Patrick's Day, and we're making it sort of an all-Irish evening for I, our guests. <laughs> I see. You're Dublin, the entertainment. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll hang around if you want to laugh at it yourself, Harry. Oh. Otherwise, I'll... <laughs> After hearing it, I've changed my mind. <laughs> the, the show really looks swell, Harry. We uh, we have Adrian O'Brien, who in a few minutes is going to be your favorite tenor. The Doherty sisters, Martin Burns and his Irish band. Gee, that sounds great, Fred. Who's first? 
Well, first, we uh, we have Professor Quigley left over from last week, you know. Oh, yes, Professor Quigley, the escape artist. Yes. He had some trouble last week. Yes, but he'll, uh, he, I'm sure he'll be all right tonight. Are you, uh, you ready, Professor Quigley? Yes, Mr. Allen, right on the job. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, last week, you may remember, Professor Quigley attempted to escape from a packing cave. In three minutes. Uh, just a minute, Professor, I'm making an announcement. I know. I didn't get the full three minutes last Wednesday. Yeah, I know, I'm trying to explain that to the radio audience. Why, my glasses fell off. I could, could have escaped. But you can't see anything in the dark with, when your I, glasses fall off. I know, I know. You can't see anything in the dark with your glasses on, either. Now, don't change the subject, Alan. I'm raring to go. Well, you want people to know where you, what you're going to do, don't you? I'm going to get in this packing case. They'll see me getting in. You don't have to explain it. I know, but people don't know what you're getting in there for. They might think you live in there or something. <laughs> Now, listen, Alan. Last week you said if I came up here tonight, I could escape. Now, that's what I'm here for. Talking isn't getting us anywhere. All right, all right. Well, now, don't get sore about it. I'm not sore. I'm not sore. If you just keep quiet a minute, I'll explain everything to our audience. Then you can get in the box and stay there for all I care. I'll be out in three minutes. All right, but... But keep quiet. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, last week, <laughs> Professor Quigley dropped his glasses in the middle of a vital uh, experiment in uh, escape, uh, in the art of escaping, I might say, uh, and wasn't able to get out within his allotted time. Now, tonight, we're locking him in the packing case again and hoping for the best. You look a little winded, Professor. Yes, I was late getting to the studio. I got stuck in the traffic. You're an escape artist and you can't get out of traffic? <laughs> yes, on account of St. Patrick's Day Parade, they kept the green lights on Fifth Avenue all day. <laughs> I couldn't get across town. Did you, uh, did you leave your car in traffic and run over? No, I didn't. I parked my car downstairs. You did. Huh? I was in a hurry, but I guess it'll be all right yes, there. Yes, it'll be all right. The doorman will keep his eye on it. You can escape with a clear conscience. And now, now Professor, if you'll get in your packing case, we'll go right ahead with the show. Now, before we start, Professor, try not to escape during one of the uh, professors not as limber as he used to be. <laughs> I remember last week he vaulted right into the box. Here, Uncle Jim had to sort of give him a little uh, piggyback in reverse, I might say. <laughs> a piggyback on the other side. <laughs> well, uh, if you, before we start, Professor, try not to escape during one of the guest acts, if you will. If you feel the time has come, try to escape, uh, if you can time it, between the acts. You know, it's... Out in now, wait minutes. a minute. It's going, to, uh, it's going to look bad if you pop out and get a big reception while someone's in the middle of a song. I'll be out in three minutes. Every man for himself. <laughs> and now, while Uncle Jim is locking and nailing Professor Quigley in, we'll return to the entertainment. You all set, Uncle Jim? Oh, okay, Fred. We don't want him to get out when we're not looking. Just lock that up. I don't think you'll... The lock is good and secure, huh? Yes, but I don't think you'll have to nail it down. We'll all keep an eye on him and see what happens. Now we'll go right along with the show. Our first guest tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to have you meet a beautiful voice possessed by a likable chap. The voice is Tanner, and the young man is Adrian O'Brien. Adrian, this is St. Patrick's Day, and if a gentleman with the name of Adrian O'Brien can't sing his best uh, on the natal day of his favorite patron saint, uh, I'm afraid the race is going to uh, uh, do something drastic about it. You're from, uh, uh, you, uh, what do you, how do you feel about it? Do you think anything? Do <laughs> you feel in rare form to, tonight? Rare voice, I might say. Well, I really should. You should. Uh, I hope it brings out the best in me. Well, I, I'm <laughs> sure that it will. You uh, you come from up in Boston, don't you? Yes. I know Bill McKenney has told me quite a lot about you and told me confidentially that you are considered to be the John McCormick of New England. Is that right? Well, I... Uh... <laughs> I've, I've got, got much to say down. about that. <laughs> <laughs> you have nothing to say, all right. Uh, I'll settle for uh, Morton Downey. From, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, how come you spend so much time up in Boston with a voice like yours? Why don't you come over here with all of the nightclubs and radio and one thing and another? I should think you'd have been over here long ago. Well, I was here, Fred, in 1931. 1931? Well, that's five years ago. Well, I was... Uh, 
pretty young, just a callow youth at that time. A callow? <laughs> <laughs> and now you have blossomed, as it were, huh? <laughs> did you hear Jack Benny? Uh, uh, and uh, did you hear our song the other night, Jack Benny and I, when we sang? Yes, I did. Uh, you did, huh? Yeah. You know, the next day that song dropped out of the hit parade and got into the sweepstakes winners. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, Adrian, well, I want you to know we're happy to have you here tonight, and I'm going to ask you what you're going to sing. Well, in honor of the occasion, I'll sing one of the best-known Irish songs, A Little Bit of Heaven. A Little Bit of Heaven. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have you ever heard the story of how Ireland got its name? I'll tell you so you'll understand from when old Ireland came. No wonder that we're proud of that dear land across the sea. For here is the way, my dear old mother, told the tale to me. Sure, a little bit of heaven fell from out the skies one day, and it nestled on the ocean. In a spot so far away And when the angels found it Sure it looked so sweet and fair They said, suppose we leave it For it looked so peaceful there then they sprinkled it with stardust just to make the shamrock grow. Is the only place you'll find them, no matter where you go. And they dotted it with silver. To make it lake so grand And when they had it finished Sure they called it A And now, before we present the next act, we'll see how Professor Quigley is doing. What's new, Professor? I'm going along fine. I'll be out in the jiffy. All right, we'll be... Yeah, there's the phone, Fred. Well, I'm busy with the professor. Will you take it, Harry? The yeah. phone is over on the chair there. Just Hello? Be... What, the doorman downstairs. What? what? Who is it, Harry? The doorman. Something about a car downstairs. Well, let me talk to him. Professor Quigley, I'll see you. Don't want to disturb any... Hello? Well? Professor Quigley's car is parked near the fire hydrant. You want to talk to him on the phone? Well, I don't know whether the professor can talk to you now. I'll see. Professor? Be right out. No, somebody wants you on the phone. What? You want it on the phone. The phone, the telephone. I'll take it. Shall we open the box? No, no. Put the phone down here. All right. Will you take this over to the professor, Uncle Jim? You just set it down there. We wouldn't want to... You all right? All right, professor. All right. Hello? You'll have to speak louder. <laughs> what? My car is next to a fire hydrant. No, no. Don't move it. I'll be right down. <laughs> okay. Goodbye. Everything all right, Professor? Yes. They want me to move my car. 
I'll be right out. All right, all right. <laughs> now, while we're waiting to welcome Professor Quigley, ladies and gentlemen, our next guests tonight are Martin Burns and his Irish Blackbird. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the best-known Irish bands in New York City. Martin uh, Burns, Mr. Burns, and his Irish Blackbirds are very well known at the Innisfail Ballrooms over on East 56th Street and uh, have played practically all of the outstanding Irish festive events in New York for the past several years. And what are you going to play tonight, Mr. Burns? I'm going to play some marches and an Irish reel. Are you Are going to play Kilkenny for me, the boys from Wexford, and uh, the reel, the old maids of Galway? Is that right? Those are the numbers, all right. Martin Burns and his Irish Blackbird. <laughs> Martin Burns and his Irish Blackbirds. And now, before the next number, come in. Is Professor Quigley here? Yes, but he's uh, pretty busy right now, well, sir. Can I see him? Not from there, no. <laughs> I quit stalling, bud. I got to see this Quigley right away. Now, just a minute. Who are you? Police headquarters. Plain clothes squad, bud. Now, where's Quigley? He's in that box. Who are you trying to kid, brother? Professor Quigley's an escape artist. He's in that box. He's busy escaping. Oh, yeah? Hey, Quigley! I'll be right out! <laughs> now, listen, stupid. Your car is parked in front of a fire hydrant downstairs. If you don't get that can out of there in two minutes, I'll run you in. Okay. I'll speed it up in here. Come on, come on. Get out of that box and move that percolator. Well, can't you come back a little later on? And the law, Alan, on this bum. Yes? Yes, you, Quigley. <laughs> Open this box in the name of the law. You better open it up, Uncle Jim. Okay, Fred. This is always going to... I'm practically out. Open that casket or I'll bust it in. I don't now, this know. This is an outrage. You've ruined my act. You can't get away with this. Come on, punk. You're resisting the law. Now, you better go. This is an officer, Professor. You better go. But what about my performance? I, what about my escape act? Well, listen, if I had a little piece around here, I could get out of that box in three minutes. <laughs> Come on, Tony. Now, just a minute, uh, officer. Now, listen, what about my there's escape action? we can trail. do about it tonight, Professor. I'll admit you've been molested, and there's only one thing I can suggest. Now, if you want to come back again next Wednesday, <laughs> I think you're entitled to another chance. I'll be here with bells on. Come on, Quigley. Now, Professor Quigley, to you, Flatfoot. I hope you won't have any trouble with that ticket, Professor. I'll get out of that in three minutes flat. <laughs> Professor Quigley never fails. Come on, bum. <laughs> Professor, uh, Professor Quigley will positively appear next Wednesday night, ladies and gentlemen. Will he escape? While you're figuring out the answer, we present our next number. Two young ladies from the County Bayonne in New Jersey. Maria and Julia Doherty. We are happy to welcome the Doherty sisters back on our program tonight, on our Irish night. And you, you girls are going to dance 
uh, a jig or a reel? Which is it? An Irish jig. An Irish jig, huh? And what is the number called? The cow that ate the blanket. Is that the That's one? That's it. I forgot about that. The, uh, the cow... <laughs> The cow that ate the blanket, its milk will tickle you to death, huh? Eh? Well, all right, you go right ahead. Gentlemen, before our bird's eye preview of next week's cantata, I would just like to thank the many friends who have taken the time to write to us both about these programs and about the two products that make them all possible. We hope you'll continue to remember the famous tube and the famous bottle. I pan a toothpaste for the smile of beauty, sal hepatica for the smile of health. I pan a sal hepatica. Thank you, Harry. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, next Wednesday evening, Town Hall tonight brings you comedy. <laughs> Drama. Honey, phases won't win me over, Schema. I know you're after my money. That's right, lady. Your income tax should have been filed the 15th. Stock market report. Consolidated tin can opened ragged. And music. Music. <laughs>